Welcome everybody for our uh, weekly seminar series at the uh, Department of Marine Geosciences. We're very honored to host uh, today Dr. Camille Thomas from the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, some words about Camille. Uh, Camille is a research associate at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Geneva, as I said, and he is interested in the impact of microbial, microbial life on sedimentary archives from the parameters influencing the deep biosphere activity and ecology in lacustrine environments to the biosignatures left by microbes in extreme environments. He uses a set of multi multidisciplinary approaches, including microbiology, sedimentology, and geochemistry, to assess the nature of life's imprint in sediments, from the Archean to the Anthropocene. He is also the co-founder of Sedimentologica, a newly created and free for all scientific journal in the broad field of sedimentary sciences. So today, um, Camille is going to talk about sedimentary traces of life in the Dead Sea from its modern shore to its deep environment. So Camille, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. And thank you all for being here. Yes, I will be, um, I will be presenting um, results that actually originate from uh, some of my PhD work that I, I did on the Dead Sea. Um, uh, deep drilling project and also discuss some uh, latest results on the current project that is still associated to it, to the Dead Sea, but uh, shallowest part. Um, so yeah, I will be discussing the geomicrobiology in the extreme Dead Sea in general. The question we ask ourselves are, what is life like actually in the Dead Sea geo environment? And to once we've done this, we're trying to get back to the past and understand what was life like in the Dead Sea so that we understand what we can learn from the past based on this understanding. So it has applications for paleoecology, paleo environments, and reconstruction of paleo climates. And also, of course, as we are in an extreme environment, uh, discussions about the limits of life and the biosignatures in extreme environment. Today, I will. Um, I will separate the talk into two different parts. First one, focusing on paleo environment in uh, Lacustrine archives. And there we'll be presenting mostly uh, results that have been published associated to the Dead Sea Deep drilling project, an ICDP project you've probably heard of, um, involving a lot of institutes, uh, different multidisciplinary collaborations. And um, I focus there on studying life in the sediment and how early diagenesis versus climatic signal uh, react with each other, are influenced by each other, and if we are able to actually extract the di diagenetic signature to better understand the climatic uh, signal from the lake sediments. And the second part, I will focus. I will focus mainly on um, on biosignatures in sediments and modern sediments looking at how minerals and microbes interact with each other, how um, microbes or mats in particular can preserve some metabolic or paleoenvironmental um, traces, and if we can recognize the conditions favoring the preservation or degradation of organic matter. So I will start with the first part and the Dead City Drilling Project. It's actually a uh, uh, taking us back to 2010, December 2010, when uh, this uh, drilling started. Nicolas was uh, super busy at that point, I can remember that. And um, you probably heard a lot about these results already. I just want to give a quick summary. Um, this was the main core you were able to extract from the center of the Dead Sea, 455 meters of halite laminated detritus and this famous AAD, alternating aragonite and detrital sediments. You have a picture of this core here. This is classical from the glacial period of the, of the Dead Sea Paleo Lakes, Lake Lisan, Lake Amora, and also um, a lot of salt. The salt that was missing from the Holocene period in particular 
um, as it's been dissolved by the circulation of water uh, around the Dead Sea. Here, we managed to, to gather this one. We had also salt from this uh, interglacial period, and it's how it looks basically in the lake, uh, deep sediments. Our goal as a, as a team at the University of Geneva and with my collaborators were actually to better understand the life traces in this deep dead sea sediment. How does it work exactly? Why, why are we interested in this? When you have a lake, you have a system where you have primary production in general and transfer of sediments from a basin towards the sediment. And as the sediment get buried, water my column microbial communities potentially get trapped together with organic matter together also with the chemistry of the pore water and as it is buried there are changes that occur in this water uh, in this sedimentary column with precipitation of diagenetic minerals for example with activity of microbial community that keep on during the in this deep sediment and as this activity continues, it changes oh. the poor water chemistry, it changes the diversity of microbial communities, how organic matter is preserved, since these communities are using uh, elements and organic matter to survive. So we are trying to see how this microbial community uh, can survive and affect the chemistry and potentially the proxy that are used for reconstructing paleoclimates and paleo environments when we do a deep drilling like the one in the Dead Sea. And the approach we are doing, we are taking here is by using a multiple biosignature approach. We study the DNA that is trapped in this sediment. We study the organic matter uh, and a particular molecular lipids, um, sorry, molecular uh, fossils like lipids, biomarkers. We study organominerals minerals that are precipitated by the activity of microbes and also the evolution of poor water chemistry and isotopes. So let me take you through this and first through the information we get from, from DNA in this environment. Um, the first thing we need to know is what is actually life like in the water column of the Dead Sea. And today, you know, it's a hypersaline environment. You know, there is not much going on in terms of life. Actually, there is one specific type of microbes that is able to develop in the sediment, uh, in the water column of this hypersaline environment. And it's an archaea that is called the uh, halobacteria. It is a hypersaline loving uh, um, um, prokaryote uh, adapted to extreme conditions, able to survive in the most hypersaline conditions. And that's what we get in the water mainly. And when you look at the shallowest sediments, you also get the same very uh, survival-like archaea. They are present in the deep, in the shallowest uh, sediment in the deep core that we obtain at 0 0.5 meter. That's what we get from the DNA. And as we look at other extreme environments throughout this core, at 91 meter gypsum that is dated at 12.5 thousand years, or in halite dated at 200 meters, uh, dated during MIS-5 at 200 meters, we find the same type of organisms, as if they were the only one able to survive in the sediments, uh, in, the, um, in the environment that deposited halite or gypsum from the Dead Sea. So that's the first idea we get from this DNA, just like there is only one type of organism able to survive, and that does not change much. Uh, from the moment sediment are deposited and the moment we recover them from drilling. But that's actually not really the case. If we look a bit further and try to reconstruct uh, the microbial community composition of the water column in the past, we get other ideas. And actually, there is one thing we can do with Highlight is get a snapshot, get a sort of time capsule out of this sediment of this halite and that's thanks to fluid inclusions in halite crystals fluid inclusions 
you know, they trapped the water from which the halite precipitated. And they also trapped organisms potentially in there. And they also trapped DNA. So if you get a snapshot of the, if you get an information of the DNA that's in there, it's potentially an information about the type of communities that were living in the water column at the moment of sediment of uh, halite precipitation. And we did that. We actually um, uh, got rid of the DNA on the, that were on the wall of halite crystals by sterilizing them. And then we extracted the DNA from the tiny fluid inclusions. And here are the information we got. I don't expect you to remember the names, but I just want to show this difference in colors. And the blue is for bacteria, the, the other prokaryotic domain of life allegedly less adapted to hypersaline conditions, but still able to survive at some point. And we see for halite dated at several, several ages through the Holocene, that we do have a bit of diversity from this DNA retrieved from fluid inclusions. So we had a bit more diverse than what we see today, communities more diverse than what we see today in the water column. Meaning that, for example, there has been a a shift in communities between the moment halite is precipitated in the lake and the moment we recover it in the deep core. And this is interesting to us because it means that something is going on in the sediment and it means that potentially the activity leading to this shift in communities may affect the sediment, the, the chemistry, the isotopes that we are using to re reconstruct paleoenvironmental conditions. To have a better view of what's going on between the moment of deposition and the moment of recovery of this of this uh, material, basically the early diagenesis, we can use other tools to actually retrace this activity. And one thing we can do is use actually the dif big differences between archaea and bacteria, which is their the structure of the plasma membrane. For archaea. It's ether lipids with an isoprenoid structure. I will show you what it's like in a few seconds. For bacteria, it's plasma membrane, with is, which is made of linear to branched fatty acids. This is giving different uh, molecular fossils in the sediment and allowing us to actually retrace changes with time. Here is a view at this. We have, have extracted the soluble organic matter from halite rich intervals throughout the Dead Sea or gypsum rich interval throughout the Dead Sea core. It's a chromatogram of an ester fraction here from a gypsum layer at 91 meter, a layer where we had mainly halobacteria, these archaea that are able to survive throughout. Um, what you see here is actually different colors, a bit of blue and a bit of red. And we find, I'm showing you, um, chromatogram showing one specific type of biomarkers. They are called wax ester. Wax esters, they are storage compounds that are synthesized by bacteria. So the blue one, in conditions of stress. In general, you don't find them deep in sediments. You find them in shallow sediments. The first time they've been found so deep in the environment. And they have a specific structure in the Dead Sea. They're composed of fragments here in red of archaea, this isoprenoid structure, typical of archaeal membrane. You see it's branched every five carbon, one, two, three, four, five, a branch, one, two, three, four, five, a branch. This is an isoprenoid structure. And this is typical of the archaea, this uh, potentially halobacteria that I just showed you in red before that are present in the water column and in the deep sediments. But here, they are attached to an ester group into a wax ester, meaning that the bacteria has been able to take up fragments of these archaea, put them together, and make these wax esters, make these storage compounds to survive in extreme environments. And we find these only in the most extreme phases of the Dead Sea, those that have the highest salinity in their pore water. So we have basically here structures made up of fragments of archaea, and bacterial membranes put together by a bacteria. If I sort of try to summarize this in a figure, this is how it shows. What we know from the DNA and the biomarkers 
it shows that at potentially at one point in the water column of the lake, we have these archaea and bacterial communities who, when they die, release core lipids. That's how they look. And we find them in the biomarkers of these halide sediments. And then as diagenesis starts, these core lipids are being degraded and put into different fragments of, of uh, this of carbon chains and at one point in the sediment only in the most extreme ones we find these wax esters meaning we have a bacteria that is able to take up a bit of fragments of dead archaea pieces of fragments of dead bacteria put them together esterify them and produce these storage lipids that they can eat on for example in case of uh, even harsher conditions. And while they do that, they can also produce a molecule of water through the esterification process. And we think this is also giving them an advantage for their survival in the deep environment of the Dead Sea that lacks uh, free water and that lacks food. So by in investigating this, we see that we are able to retrace one of the um, carbon um, cycling, carbon recycling um, activity. Here is a, a study of a specific interval that corresponds to the period during which sapropel one deposited in the Mediterranean basin. And during this period in the Dead Sea, we have a decrease of magnesium two plus in the pore water of the sediment and an increase of sulfate, meaning we have probably a pulse of fresh water that is big enough to affect the deep, uh, the deep chemistry of the, the of the lake. In the meantime, there is an increase and a shift in um, delta S34 of sulfate and uh, delta O18 of sulfate. And this is indicative of an increase in sulfate reduction, activity of microbes that reduce sulfate by consuming organic matter. And um, we also see in this pore water that we have a decrease in the delta C13 of the DIC. This is showing recycling of organic matter and an increase of the DIC itself, showing the same thing. In this interval, we have big, um, we have, so, sorry, I mean, the occurrence of C17 alkanes and phyten. These are markers of cyanobacteria, meaning that during this interval, there is a change in the water column allowing the development of cyanobacteria because they need light to develop this cyanobacteria. And this organic matter is then transferred to the lake and allows an increased microbial activity. So through this study, it's basically, we are basically able to show how the Dead Sea reacts to a humid event like the one that resulted in the sapropel one period in the Mediterranean basis. In the Dead Sea, it results in a lot of humidity, shifting the concentration of magnesium 2 plus in the pore water, allowing the production of, uh, of uh, organic matter through photosynthetic activity in the water column. And this is something that is actually not so common in the Dead Sea period. Right now, there is no photosynthetic activity because it's too saline. The humidity here during sapropel one period actually allows this and leads to an intensified microbial activity in the sediment in the end. So what does it mean in general? It means that at depth, microbes are influenced by the initial climatic conditions at the moment of sedimentary deposition. And that this can still be observed after thousands of years when we recover the sediment from a scientific drilling. 
this activity has an effect on organic matter degradation. It varies whether we are in dry or humid periods. And it affects also the elemental cycling of sulfur, of carbon, and potentially of iron. And I just want to show you an additional study we did here focusing on the diagenetic minerals precipitating in the sediment of the Dead Sea. And in particular on iron sulfides that are formed by the process of sulfate reduction. Degradation of organic matter through the reduction of sulfate that leads to sulfide. And this sulfide reacts with iron and forms um, pyrite or potentially uh, machinawite or gregite. Machinawite or gregite, they are precursors of the pyrite in this process of um, diagenetic iron sulfide formation. And in general, they're not so well preserved in lakes. Actually, generally you find pyrite. This is um, because spiritization is complete because we have a lot of sulfate reduction. But in the Dead Sea, it's different. In the Dead Sea, sometimes you find pyrite and that's only during glacial periods. While during interglacial, it's very rare that you have pyrite and you have mainly machinawite and gregite. And if you put together all these pieces that I talk, talk to you about, the fact that during, during a uh, humid period, you have an increased microbial cycling and an increased in sulfate reduction. While it's not the case, and there is very limited food during interglacial period, and you can basically uh, explain these differences in formation of iron sulfide. During glacial period, you have quality organic matter produced by primary production in the lake because you have fresh water brought to the lake. That's all those complete sulfate reduction and full puritization of these iron sulfide minerals. During interglacial periods, you're in drier conditions, weak freshwater inputs, few organic matter that is transferred to the lake, limiting by this, um, in the limiting the production, the the um, um, the presence of organic matter of quality for the sulfate reducers to eat, and not allowing the full puritization of these precursors. So you preserve gregite, okay? The that's that's interesting. But why? It's interesting because gregite is a magnetic mineral, and basically people that are working on on um, magnetostratigraphy a bit pissed off when there is craigite because it it, uh, it influences their signal through this diagenetic activity. And that's what my colleague Yael Ebert um, uh, showed in this paper that basically these magnetic properties uh, are potentially, money can actually be used um, by deciphering this diagenetic process as a, a specific proxy for the regional hydroclimate of the Dead Sea. So basically, just like the microbial communities, this energetic process, they will fluctuate with climatic conditions through uh, the changes in freshwater primary production and influencing the, the deep cycling of sulfur potentially in the sediment, leading to the precipitation of specific minerals impacting the magnetic signatures and leading to the use of other minerals or new minerals as proxy for hydroclimatic conditions. Okay, um, now I am done with the first part and I will uh, take you up to the surface again of the Dead Sea and to its shores, um, in particular to the sinkhole uh, system and sinkhole areas. And I want to show you uh, what we can study in these uh, weird environments and how that can help us understand uh, ancient signatures um, uh, in the geological record. First, I will start with uh, um, talking to you about uh, how microbial life actually develops in the, in the, in, on, on, on Earth. You have to know that 80% of the microbial biomass is actually in the geosphere. So it's quite important and it makes sense to actually study it. And 80% of this life goes into um, 
uh, ecosystems that are biofilms and EPS. EPS, they are exopolymeric substances. This is what it looks. It's this slimy texture that you can find, for example, in microbial mats. And these are originally, this is what is forming biofilms. And this is what you will find uh, leading to stromatolites. So basically they are some of the first traces of life we have on earth and in the sediment, they will form microbial induced sedimentary structure or microbiolites like stromatolites or thrombolites. So better understanding how life develops and what this structure can actually record is uh, important for us to understand past ecosystem, how organisms developed in the past and what the environments were like in the past. But we don't really know what these EPS actually record. They're able to record a lot of things because microbes, they attach to, an, uh, to a substrate through this EPS. They can uh, protect themselves from contaminations from the outside and the EPS will bind to cations, for example. But they will also allow enzymatic exchange, elemental exchange and communication between microbes. So you have a lot of information going on. It's super dense, super active. We don't exactly know what's going on. So by studying these, and basically we can learn a bit more about, about life in the past. And I will focus here on the specific example of the Tumbiana stromatolites. These are some of the best preserved stromatolites on the rock record. They are 2.7 billion years old, and they are rich in arsenic. This is an arsenic enrichment in some of the microbial, uh, in some of the organic matter lamina of these stromatolites. They are beautiful, and people think that they are traces of um, arsenic cycling by bacteria, by some bacteria before the appearance of oxygen, oxygenic photosynthesis on Earth. So people have been studying sort of analogs, like some of the mats that exist on the Andean plateaus, trying to understand what arsenic was like and showing that potentially there is a full um, anoxygenic photosynthesis associated to, um, um, to arsenic that can go on and is a sort of ancestor of uh, photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis that then leads to the oxidation of, of our planet. So quite an important stuff, but actually are we understanding exactly what's going on there? Well, this is where the Dead Sea comes. Because of its very dynamic uh, environment through these sinkholes, we have a lot of diverse chemistry. We have a lot of diverse microbial compositions marked by changes in salinity, marked by production of a lot of EPS and biofilms that are sometimes mineralizing into, microbi into microbiolites and sometimes not. So basically we went to this environment to try to understand what was recorded in these systems. And here is a picture again of this, mi of this uh, microbial mat transforming into stromatolite. These are carbonates at the top of it in, in brown. Um, you can see here some of these concretions. They are aragonite concretions. You have a lot of colors showing diversity in microbial communities, a lot of EPS, the slimy structure being produced, filamentous organisms, and the whole thing turning into a sort of um, microbial rich carbonate sediments. What we did is we extracted a, a section of this microbial mat and tried to map it for its chemistry, its microbial composition, and to see how all these um, bio, all the bio and geosphere interacted with each other. And the first thing we saw is that it was super enriched in arsenic. So we went to the synchrotron to get a better view of this arsenic enrichment. And we could actually, um, actually quantify it to a 15, more than 15,000 ppm, which is 400 times um, the the, the arsenic composition of the whole mat, we reached 15 
thousand ppm within this lamina here, and it's twelve thousand times more than the arsenic in the water of this sinkhole it was sampled from. So this is quite intense. Uh, together with that, we have manganese. Um, we don't have so much sulfur, although that could be expect expected based on what we know from uh, other arsenic-rich environments. And we do have we don't have many minerals in these layers of arsenic. So what is actually the meaning of this super rich arsenic, what it is associated to, and what can this enrichment tell us about our environment, whether it's its microbial community or the conditions from which it, it derived from. We did a bit of mapping. We went further to map, uh, to map this arsenic enrichment. This is the top of the microbial mat I just showed you. This is the very arsenic rich layer here. And uh, in blue, I'm showing you the fluorescence of calcium carbonate. So you see it's mainly here, not so much into this layer. And in red and yellow, you have pigments from photosynthetic activity. And you see actually a lot of it. And when we zoom in in this heavy arsen arsenic enrichment, we see that arsenic is actually uh, linked together with silicium. And also here I'm showing you um, a correlation between arsenic and, and magnesium. So associated with this arsenic, we have a lot of silicium and magnesium. And this is quite common from uh, biofilms. They're very often enriched in magnesium and silicon. Um, we don't exactly know why, um, but it's very, very common. Um, meanwhile, it's not enriched in the mineral phases. The arsenic here, I'm showing you a synchrotron-based XRF of, oops, the square B here should be here. Actually, these are the um, calcium carbonate concretions that we suspect are formed by, min by microbial activity, we see that they are not enriched in arsenic. They are enriched in calcium and potentially in nickel. So the arsenic is mainly um, uh, associated with the biofilm, with the EPS, and not with the mineral phases. But we wanted to know a bit further, a bit more about this association. So as we were on the, at the synchrotron, we run Xanes analysis. This Xanes, or I don't know if you say Xanes or Xane. Xane's analysis is actually uh, uh, designed to show us what arsenic is bound to and also gives us information about the redox processes, the redox status of this arsenic. And here I'm showing you different, um, different profiles um, of this arsenic taken at different points throughout the mat, and they're all the same. And we try to compare them with reference material, arsenic species, whether they are um, organic arsenic or also um, um, mineral arsenic, arsenic oxides. And you see that the profile, they don't match so much with the different points we took. So they are not actually showing us that these, these points correspond to such species reference, reference material. Um, the reference line is also of importance. Um, the, the white line, sorry, here, the white line, it's the peak of this profile. You see it's at, it's, it is at 11,872 um, electron volts. And this is also a specific signature. So we went to the literature and tried to find other white lines that have the same values comparing with other reference material that have been published before. And we see that it matches a bit with some um, arsenic species, uh, that with organoarsenic species. Here, tetrametyl arsenium, it's not far, far from arsenobitaine or arsenocholine that are common features um, that are produced by microbes. It is not perfect. But we think that basically through these studies, we do have a signature of organoarsenic in our microbial mat, and that is arsenic-5, as it is generally found in these organoarsenics. 
So why are organoarsenic concentrated within this layer and under which circumstances? That's now the next thing we need to solve. And to do that, I'm using uh, DNA together with my colleague, Danny Ionescu. We actually uh, studied the genomes, the metagenomes of these uh, microbial mat. We tried to, to uh, target, um, sorry, we tried to um, understand what were what were the organisms that were involved in arsenic cycling? And we were able to do that and realize that there were a whole lot of organisms actually involved in that had genes associated to the arsenic cycle in this microbial mat, not just one, not just one specific uh, species. So that's giving us a first hint. A second hint is to identify these arsenic genes. And we've been able to do that. And we see that we have a lot of arsenate reductase. This is a gene allowing microbes to take up arsenic-5 that may be toxic and re reduce it to arsenite. We have a bit of arsenic arsenic resistance protein. We have arsenite, also methyl transferase, and this one is actually allowing organisms to take up this arsenite and transfer it into organoarsenic. And this is what we were interested in. So we suspect this is what is going on. These process are actually detoxification process, meaning that organisms, when they are in an arsenic rich environment, they try to get rid of this arsenic and put them into organoarsenic. That makes it much less toxic for them. However, no organisms, no genes was found um, um, in this environment. There was no gene that linked um, arsenic with arsenotrophic organisms. There is no organisms that is able to use arsenic to gain energy. They only get rid of it through this detoxification process. Okay, that was a lot of information. So I'm going to try to summarize this right now for you. First, we have microbial systems in the sinkholes of the Dead Sea, and they are super interesting because they are diverse and they show weird enrichments of elements. Among them, arsenic. That is for the first time, as far as I know, but if you have more information, I would be super happy to, to hear about it. For us, it is the first time that there is so much arsenic that is detected in the Dead Sea environment. What is the origin of this arsenic? It seems that it's arsenic-5. There is not so much in the water of the, of the sinkhole today, but it's super concentrated in the Dead Sea. So we think there might have been a pulse, a sort of whiff at one point of arsenic. I was brought from this fresh water that is circulating from the underground. And that's actually quite common that arsenic is sometimes super enriched in one place and then it stops and you'll find um, and you'll find in another well, for example, um, a bit more enriched. So it comes and goes, and that's also the bit complexity of the contaminations in arsenic in the environment. Here, this arsenic is super enriched in the microbial mat, and this is thanks to arsenic detoxification process by microbes, but it's not associated to arsenotrophy. It's not associated to a metabolic process that allows microbes to gain energy. The arsenic is not in mineral phases, it's only in the organics. So we may question its potential for fossilization into microbiolites. What does it say? Basically, it means that first biofilm are a marker of the paleoenvironmental conditions here, that although we have microbes that are able to detoxify arsenic, there must have been a moment where there has been a lot of arsenic, and the biofilm is actually recording this enrichment in arsenic, this paleo, uh, this uh, um, uh, paleo enrichment in arsenic at one point. Second, 
well, we can sort of discuss how arsenic can be interpreted from stromatolites. For example, if we get back to the Tumbiana stromatolite, we have here organic matter rich layers um, that are enriched in arsenic. And that's also the case in our system. But here in our system, it only shows arsenic detoxification and not arsenotrophy. So it does not actually go in the direction of uh, potential um, metabolic signature for this arsenic, at least not one that allows organisms to gain energy. Of course, the Dead Sea system is very different from the Tumbiana Lake system, in particular because we have oxygen and we cannot say, we cannot really discuss these interpretations, but it shows that we have to be careful with what we extract, extrapolate from these microbial mats. And finally, I want to point out the fact that this process of enriching arsenic um, in a biofilm is quite impressive and it provides avenues that are already exploited today for uh, bioremediation or the biotechnology process. The contamination of arsenic, enrichment of metal through biomining, for example. This is something that the Dead Sea environment and its sinkhole system actually can be studied for and may uh, be, it may provide a sort of pool of uh, discoveries that are yet to be actually investigated. Okay, I will finish this. And I want to thank all my collaborators, my funding bodies, um, and all the people that have been working. And of course, I want to thank you for your attention. And again, remind you, as Nicolas discussed a bit earlier, um, that have, I have been with some amazing colleagues. Some of them actually passed through the University of Haifa, uh, co-founding a journal in sedimentology that is community driven, which means it is completely free for you to publish in, read and share. So we're trying to improve basically the, the publishing system through these studies, through this, through, this, um, through this journal. It is now open for submissions. So I'm free to discuss this with you um, anytime and feel free to have a look at the, the website. Thank you very much. Well, Great, fantastic work. I I love the talk, really very much. And congratulations for Sedimentologica. I actually will will have a look, and it's good to publish it, you know, in any in any way possible. So thank you very much. I have questions, but I will wait until the audience will ask them. So I'm open the podium for I'm opening the just jump in and ask the questions. I see that Italian is easy one to ask because you are unmuted. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for the students to ask first. Okay, students, come on. Don't be afraid. We don't shoot. We bite. <laughs> mm. There was a lot of bio biology together with geology, so feel free to also ask uh, questions that may that about the the overall understanding I may have uh, jumped a bit sometimes and make I'm I'm happy to explain a bit more. Okay, here we have Jeremy Gabriel. I think. We, yeah, we don't We don't hear, no. <laughs> How about this now? Yes. Now it's working. Okay, there we go. Just had to change some settings. Um, yeah, so I don't understand uh, a whole lot about the uh, microbial living stuff. Um, I like to study sediments more. Um, but I was just curious, you specifically brought up... Um, I would say, I don't want to call it an event, but something at 4.6 thousand years where you had more of the uh, Hellanorobium bacteria, okay. right? Um, and and you, you mentioned, 
I'm just curious, what kind of interpretations do you make of what the overall environment was doing at that time? Just because in my research, um, there's actually an event that we're targeting around 4.2 thousand years. I'm wondering if this is maybe all within standard deviations. Is this all part of of one event, or maybe uh, do you think the Dead Sea is kind of recording uh, an early start to this kind of climatic shift that then is being recorded in in the Nile sediments, Mediterranean sediments that I'm looking at? <laughs> okay, well, I don't want to be uh, disappointing. Um, but it's this um, DNA that we extract from fluid inclusion is just uh, is not exactly representative of everything that was going on in the water column. It's just one a bit of DNA trapped in a fluid inclusion, one crystal in the lake. So it means that there was a bit some diversity, but it doesn't. We cannot interpret it as a specific event or a specific activity even it's just uh one piece of dna oh okay so you can't yeah. maybe make like uh say it was getting into a drier period or there was maybe more fresh water input oh maybe. not exactly okay <laughs> all but right in the dead sea at that period it was halite rich for sure we had halite precipitating from the water column so i suspect we were in a relatively dry period for sure Okay, perfect. Yeah, because that's uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking into into drier periods. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, somebody else. Don't be shy. Camille is a good guy. He doesn't bite. <laughs> I, I have a question about the um, uh, organic uh, arsenic molecules. Um, mm -hmm. I understand that you work on arsenic because you have this uh, deep time analog uh, uh, billions of years ago. But did you did you try to measure other uh, uh, metals in in the in the crusts in the biofilms? Yes, actually, um, we well we mapped uh, roughly all metals that we were able to map through our okay. synchrotron study um arsenic was just popping out so much that was that wasn't expected so we took this direction because we thought that okay. would be actually a, quite interesting but there is a there are some metals there is quite a lot of manganese that is associated to this um, this arsenic actually actually in the layer not directly with the arsenic species um and we find a bit of nickel, as I showed you. We find a bit of zinc as well. And I'm also interesting, interested in, in understanding a bit more how microbes are cycling these trace metals. Yeah. And uh, if that could also be used by biosignatures or not. And that's that's, that will be the next step, in particular in calcium carbonate. Yeah. But how can you... You know, we are now today living in a very polluted environment. How can you be sure that uh, it's a, the, it's a natural source uh, and not something anthropogenic coming from the atmosphere with dust or something like that? Well, for for the arsenic, we can't actually, um, and the fact that it seems to be so um, uh, sporadic mm -hmm. is um, also saying that potentially that could be a, that could be a, an anthropogenic contamination for sure we have no idea where this arsenic is actually coming from i suggested that it's been um, transported from the underground from the water but i don't know where the arsenic uh, was actually taken from yeah. and, do and you, can you... sorry do, do you have hints do you have ideas about you uh, know, uh, no i'm working also with, uh, uh, anthropogenic pollution and um, and uh, I used to work uh, not not work but during my postdoc there was sitting next to me somebody working on arsenic in in uh, waters in, in in you know hydrology just uh, runoff and uh, he had high concentrations of arsenic coming from polluted uh, sites so and you know there is industry in the Dead Sea environment so I don't know maybe uh, that could be a source even through groundwater that's also possible mm -hmm. uh, but 
I have no idea. I don't know what's the concentrations and you know uh, what to expect, but I, I just wonder if it's a natural or anthropogenic. In both cases, it's interesting. Um, yeah, but, but, but I'd be happy I if I'd be happy if you can uh, uh, give me some contacts about people working on arsenic in uh, in Israel and in the Dead Sea environment in particular. That would be great. I don't think somebody. I, I don't think somebody in the Dead Sea is working on it, but I I would look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I, 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 and I wanted to ask you, it, it's a request. Um, can you can you explain how you, you talked about XRF elemental mapping? Uh, how do you prepare the sample for that? It's like what, um, you know, the basic procedure, is it because the, the, the sediment is so fluffy? Uh, how, how do you prepare it for, for analysis? Well, for for um for this mapping, we embedded the microbial mat in a resin. An acrylic resin. So um, you have to to make sure that your fragment is um, um, sort of compact, you know, or and and then you put it in the resin, and the resin reacts quite rapidly with a, a quick change in temperature, and that's yeah. allow, allowing the microbial mat to be fixated in a, so, yeah. in a substrate, and then you can cut it and polish it, and that's how we do. That's where we do the XRF. Okay. And you, but, you do it in the field or you, you come back with it and then... I came back with it, yeah. Okay. But please don't tell the borders. I sometimes have issues with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey. It was really, really interesting. You're welcome. Um, considering the arsenic and Ravita's questions, I was thinking maybe natural arsenic can be on the... Uh, Radev and Meshash formations. I'm just questioning. I mean, I don't know. Maybe Itzik or Avital can point out. Maybe maybe Maybe. the question should be pointed to the people working on the Meshash and Radev formations, if there is arsenic over there. But I mean, this is a possibility, Camille, okay. that comes out in my mind as a natural source for arsenic. Yeah. I write this down, and I think I'll I'll follow I'll follow with the there are, email. There are some that. there are some people working or that they know about these two formations that they are in depth over there and outcropping not so far actually. So you know, cool. consider okay. And if you want contacts, I mean, just send the mail, and you know, we will we will help you. Great, thanks so much. Well, I will ask questions. I have. I have two. One is what do you think will happen during events, rather seismic or climate, um, in which uh, hippopycnal flows enhance oxygenation and nutrients to the deep um, Dead Sea? What happened with that oxygenation into the, um, you know, the biological processes? If you if you oxidize your your deep Dead Sea environment. Well, yeah, eventually when you have a seismicity event, you have or a seismic event or or uh, extreme floods. So you will you will have hippopycnal flows mm-hmm. providing you with, uh, let's say, fresher water and enhanced with uh, nutrients, basically, the trickle matter into the deep environment, how that actually influenced the biology. Well, I think um, I would say <laughs> I would say positively. Meaning that you probably will have um, a change um, in uh, microbial activity and an enhancement of microbial activity thanks to fresh water being brought to to this environment and also um, and also oxygen. And I'm wondering actually if that is not um, a process, if that could be a process for actually uh, um, um, forming and preserving these. Um, uh, native sulfur concretions that we find in the um, in the core of the Dead Sea, because you would need you would need probably sulfide oxidation to to do that. And um, we had a bit of discussion with uh, Orit Sivan, I think, about this topic with also um, uh, Itai. Um, I wonder if that that could be actually a, a process for leaving out this kind of. Uh, this kind of uh, sulfur concretions. Yeah, it's something maybe to explore. Uh, my second question is that, that you mentioned that pyrite 
is more often during gla glacial periods while macking macking a weight I, I i google it actually <laughs> i should have Mac put Mac some Makina white Makina white no it's fine it's fine Makina white is during interglacial but just i remember when i was trying to date some reformation uh, you know with ranitorium and also with osl and i tried also tl and i remember taking kilograms of uh, material kilograms literally something big and melt and basically passing everything through hf dissolving everything and at the end i had pyrite so i don't know if this is pyrite or not i mean i remember having the pyrite but it was kilograms of rock but that's interglacial not glacial so or maybe it was not pyrite and it was a uh, makina white although it looks like uh, gold it looks like pyrite so I mean, and just ask if this is a rule. I'm back. You... Sorry. No, no problem. You you have pirate only on glacial, so you may have pirate on you know interglacials. Um. So I missed part of the question because I was disconnected. Yeah. Um. I'm sorry about this, but you said I I disconnected when you were saying that you extracted literally kilograms. Of, kilograms uh, of the Samra formation, yeah, in order to try to date with TL. And for the process, I dissolved most of it on HF. Mm -hmm. And then um, the remnants were, as much as I remember, were pyrite. Okay. But you you were sure it was pyrite and not another iron sulfide? No, I, I, can't, I can't be sure. because But, but okay. it was, you know, gold. Gold is pyrite. Yeah, but yeah in general, yes. On, yeah, when I look on Makina White, it doesn't look gold. It looks like um Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how the Makina White works. And and that and that's from um outcrops, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, um for sure there are changes in chemistry, especially for this um this um uh, precursor unstable phases um iron sulfide. So I, I know that for example um, you actually do find a lot of pyrite in the in the um, in the outcrops that you don't find, and and the occurrence is quite different in quite different in the um, in the deep sediments. So that might be a, a response, and also probably the deep lake doesn't react exactly the same as the the shallow lake because the fresh water that you bring is um, first coming from the shores, right? And so potentially you will have a more, you will have a more organic matter associated to this fresh water that you bring that is created through photosynthetic activity near the shores, basically where you bring the fresh water. So I'm suspecting that co could also be a, an explanation. What we record, I think the important thing about this Dead Sea uh, deep drilling um, uh, core and especially the one in the center is that we are recording processes that are that have been able to um, white to be widespread throughout the throughout the lake and sort of going away from the the effects of uh, um, small inputs you know wadis things like this um, um, in the lake. Okay. Okay, great. Well, somebody has a question? Mm, no. Wait, well, anyway, we are a little bit late into... Oh, it's a... Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a small and very ignorant one. <clears throat> I was uh, shocked and shattered by the your answer uh, to the question about uh, can you map climate? And the question is, what would it take for you to use this methodology to to actually address climate what 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 do you mean can you map climate <laughs> well you said that we we are looking at a little inclusion of a little you know a small event in a little inclusion and so we cannot pay, we cannot say things about or we cannot be certain about globally or regionally a regional climate events. What would it mm -hmm. take to actually do that, to actually be able to use this methodology 
for addressing uh, climate events? What would you need to do for that? Mm, I would I would rely on more sampling throughout the lake and more reproduction of this um, um, DNA extraction from um, from fluid inclusions because these fluid inclusions they are just I mean it's quite hard to get DNA out of them we don't get much of it and it's just one crystal precipitated at very rapidly in one event um, uh, in in the lake so you will have to you would have to do this throughout the lake and hopefully you will get a, a potentially a better information about the microbial communities that were present in the lake and that's just giving you an information about the paleoecology not directly about the climate but then you can can try to yeah. go a bit further <laughs> but, um... You were using highlight the highlight, right? Uh, yes. If if you could use carbonates, would it be easier? Um. Well, from the Dead Sea, I I don't know if they get. I'm really... thinking in a broader in a broader ah. sense. If you if you could get because in the Dead Sea also, but uh, if you could get autogenic carbonates and and get the inclusions from autogenic carbonates, would it be an easier trick? Um. It could, I suspect, it could work if um, if they're able to, if they're big enough to trap organisms. I know it works for gypsum, for example, in other environments. In the Messinian gypsum in Sicily, they have been able to identify some organisms too. And I don't know they if they extracted um, if they extracted the DNA, but they did they did find they did find organisms. Carbonates, why not? Um, I'm not familiar with the size of fluid inclusions and how um, if autogenic carbonate can actually uh, can actually trap anything other than fluids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that we are a little bit late. So again, thank you very much, Camille. Really impressive and very nice, very, very nice structure as well. And, Thank you, Nicolas. Um, and uh, well, yeah, we, you know, we keep in touch. <laughs> With pleasure, always. Same okay, with I'll be in touch. Thank too. you. Great Thank talk. You. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye, everybody.